Hello, thank you for joining us for this presentation from the National Survivor Network on survivor leadership and trauma-informed storytelling during training. I'm Chris Ash, and I am the Survivor Leadership Program Manager at the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, where a big part of my job is running the National Survivor Network. The NSN is a professional development membership network. We are values-based and we are for survivors of human trafficking who are working in movement leadership or hoping to work in movement leadership using a public health, human rights, and harm reduction approach. So why are we having this presentation? Well, since the human trafficking movement started trying to move towards more survivor leadership, a lot of times survivors have experienced that leadership as being tokenizing or focused on their stories. You may be asked to share your stories for policymakers. Um, and often in those cases, you share your story and some of your insights from it, but someone else who's a policy expert goes and um, explains some of the policy ramifications. Or you may share your story for um, peers to help inspire them or you may share your story for funders to inspire them to donate. Um, but in a lot of these situations, you're still being expected to share your story. Uh, a lot of times that can be confusing for survivors when we go to work in spaces where we're now expected to train and to educate people about trafficking, prevention, and appropriate responses. Because in so many spaces, we're expected to share our stories. It becomes normalized. Sometimes we may even feel like we're going on into autopilot and just starting to share details of our stories um, without even thinking about whether or not it's conducive to our goals in that moment. Lived experience insights, they do have unique value, right? We can't minimize the value they have for the work. Um, for how we do this work, for other professionals who don't have your unique lived experience, hearing about your lived experience and your insights can be very valuable. This includes people who don't have lived experience of trafficking, but it can also include other survivors who've maybe experienced different forms of trafficking or different elements of forced fraud or coercion or exploitation. Our lived experience insights have unique value for resetting the balance because at this point we've had decades of people who are not themselves survivors of trafficking thinking they know what we need and telling other people and telling us what we need, sometimes um, without really listening to us. So these lived, these lived experience insights, they are valuable. Personal storytelling, which is when, what we refer to it as when we're sharing details or stories from our lived experience of, of trafficking or of other parts of our lives, can serve multiple purposes. There are a lot of different reasons why people may share their trauma stories, right? One of them may be to receive validation, affirmation, or support. Uh, we hear from survivors that sometimes when they share their stories, that they then have someone who believes them when maybe people before didn't believe them, or they may be validated. Yes, that was horrible. I'm so sorry you went through that. You may receive affirmation. Wow, you're so strong and powerful. Um, look, at, look at how resilient you were to survive all of that, right? All of these reasons, that, that reason, all of those are for you, right? Those are to benefit the person sharing the story. Um, personal storytelling can also help us um, or be part of us seeking connection or support from others who've been through similar experiences. Uh, again, that's something that benefits the person telling the story. I'm sharing my story and my details because I'm hoping to connect with other people who've been through something similar so that I can feel less alone. Uh, similarly, sometimes we share our stories to empower others who have been through similar situations. Sometimes we share our stories for other survivors to signal to them that we've been through similar things and that we've, we've somehow made it through these experiences and that we're available to provide mutual support. And then sometimes we share personal storytelling uh, details from our experience to educate others about the dynamics of human trafficking and other forms of trauma. 
that's one that is also for others. It's less about what we need and it's more about providing them with information they need. But training is not the same thing as personal storytelling. Um, you can include educational components into your storytelling, and you can also include personal storytelling components in your educational efforts and training, but they're not the same. And that can be confusing for survivors when we're used to being hired to tell our stories, and now we're being hired to give a training. And we're like, huh, I'm not quite sure how to separate those two out. So we're gonna just pause and think about what are the purposes of training, right? Training, just like storytelling, can serve multiple purposes. Training can be to educate the public about community dynamics so that they can sort of help prevent trafficking or recognize it. Training can be to educate the general public about what survivors need so that they can build communities of care. And what I mean by communities of care, envisioning a culture in which people are looking out for each other and offering support to each other and taking care of people who've been through hard times. Training can be so that we can educate other survivors, either about their rights, know your rights trainings, about options that are available to them and remedies when they've experienced harm. We can educate other survivors about the systems they have to engage with so that they can better navigate those systems or help other survivors to navigate those systems. Training can be to educate professionals. We may be educating professionals about risk and protective factors for violence so that they can advocate for decreasing risk factors and increasing protection. We may want to educate professionals about the diversity of trafficking experiences or survivor needs so that they understand that we're, we're not a monolith, right? We each have different experiences and needs and understandings of what healing means for us. We may want to educate professionals about competent care for survivors. How do you do trauma-informed care? How do you do patient-centered care? We may want to educate them about how to ethically and meaningfully engage survivor feedback into their program development and design and implementation. Because now a lot of folks are realizing survivor engagement in our leadership and planning and programming is essential to having better programming and yet we can't just run on the streets and grab the first few survivors we see without really thinking through the ethics, the preparation, the support. And in trainings, we can also give people opportunities to practice and workshop and brainstorm those things that we've learned. So typically in a good training, um, you know, I know that a, an online webinar presentation is challenging to do this in, but typically in trainings, we're going to want to give people chances to practice them, to, to brainstorm ideas, to maybe do a role play, to do activities that help engage the learning using adult learning methods. Training is always for others. So while storytelling can sometimes be for others and sometimes it's for you meeting one of your needs, training is always for others. And so we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we're treated ethically and that our needs are met. So we are still a person in this mix, but training is gonna be geared to the learning needs of the audience. So for example, some organizations focus on training law enforcement and criminal legal professionals. Some organizations focus on training direct service providers like crisis responders, clinicians, case managers, support group facilitators, hospital advocates. Heal training focuses on training, heal trafficking tra focuses on training healthcare professionals and healthcare system professionals. And the National Survivor Network focuses on training survivors working in the movement and training others working with survivors as their colleagues, right? So your audience is going to be different. So the needs of your training audience are going to be different. So let's look a little at the relationship between training and storytelling now that we know they're not exactly the same. Sometimes storytelling can support your training goals. So for example, you may name a risk factor or a dynamic you experienced in order to illustrate a point or engage your audience. 
you may want to name something um, that would have helped you, uh, right? So there's a difference between being like, here's something I'm still salty about years later, and I'm going to get really mad and tell you every detail of how horrible it was. Uh, that's more storytelling uh, for you to get it off your chest. But if you want to educate, you may be like, here's something that would have helped if I had had access to it. Here's something that that um, direct service provider could have done that would have helped build safety and healing and trust with me. So this is where maybe you name something you did not receive in order to highlight the importance of comprehensive support and a variety of healing options. And you may also name something you've learned during your healing or legal processes that would be beneficial for others to know. So in that case, you're not even naming anything that has to do with your trafficking itself. You're naming something about your healing experience that you learned that was helpful for you. But a lot of times storytelling can disrupt or run counter to your training goals. And it's important to be cautious and conscious of how that can happen. <clears throat> so for example, <coughs> excuse me, for example, sharing too many details of your story can cause attendees to get hyper-focused on your singular survivor experience. Now, what that means is they get so focused on all the details of your trafficking that they start to assume that that's what all trafficking looks like. They get so focused on hearing all the details of what you needed that they start to assume that that's what all survivors need. And that can distract them from learning about the broad needs of survivors. It can give them a mistaken understanding of how trafficking happens or of what survivors need. Sometimes you may get hyper-focused on your own personal story, which can cause you to miss or exclude other equally important identities and experiences. Sometimes we have to check ourselves and remember that, that that thing that you needed or wanted that was so important to you, someone else may really, really not want it. Someone else may not benefit from that at all. And that's hard for us because these things play such a key role in how we understand our recovery. But we need to remember that if we're the one in the room giving that training, we carry all those other survivors with you and with us into that room, right? So we can remember that we want to advocate for a diverse group of survivors, not just those who experienced what we did the way we did or needed what we needed. Sometimes sharing too many details or sharing them in a sensationalized way can cause your audience to completely disengage from the learning. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes two things may happen. One, if you've ever heard the word infotainment, that is where we try to provide something that's meant to share some information while really providing entertainment. It's sort of blurring the lines between what's informative and what's um, entertaining, right? What's meant to titillate and keep people engaged and hold their focus through um, arousing their senses as they're hearing the story and suddenly they're feeling some of the fear that we were feeling and they're feeling some of the hopelessness that we were feeling, right? If you've ever heard infomercials where it's, it says it's presenting itself as information but it's really meant to be a commercial, infotainment is similar in that it's presenting itself as information, but it's really about titillation and entertainment, right? The other thing that can happen is that if your audience has a trauma response from hearing all the details, that can lead to less effective learning. So let's unpack those two a little bit. So think of the media as an example of this education versus infotainment distinction. So think about reality TV. When they do reality TV, they're not really interested in reality, right? Their goal is high ratings, high number of views, increasing the funding, right? Because we know that the way it works is high, high ratings and high viewership makes, you, makes it to where you can charge more for advertisements, right? And salaciousness can accomplish all of those things. So reality TV, it's not really about reality. It's about ratings, right? Creating good TV. Um, I can share a story that I had a friend who was on a, a well-known um, courtroom reality show where they tried cases, who said that um, before going on this as a um, defendant, she was told, 
for you and your other person to play up your arguments, right? We just want a good show, right? So again, that's, that's a different goal from educating someone on, on what trafficking is, how they can help trafficking survivors, how they can prevent um, trafficking from happening. And we have to remember that all that salaciousness and sensationalism can have harmful impact. One thing that can happen is it can make uh, people who are attending continue to dehumanize and other, and other the survivors and think we're just not like them. They're so different. Their backgrounds are so different. Um, it doesn't build connection for them to hear all the things you went through when they have no experiences that are anything like that. It may build distance, right? Where sometimes when you're doing your training, if you share a story about what you you know, when you were little, you had a favorite um, stuffed animal, right? And I loved having it. And sometimes I would hold that at night when I was having a hard time from everything that was happening to me. That's something they can relate to, right? So remember, we want to make sure that our story telling, storytelling doesn't get into salaciousness that makes us sound exoticized or other. We want to remember that we want to build connection with people, right? And humanize survivors for them. We, um, we know that salaciousness can sometimes contribute to and reinforce stereotypes when we don't ground it in the context of um, what we were, what our options we had available to us. This salaciousness can also desensitize the public to the intimate nature of these experiences. So for example, if the public just hears us talking so openly all the time about all the intimate details of our trafficking when it's in a training setting, then when you get to Q&A, they may not be asking you questions about how they can provide better services. They may be asking you really intrusive, nosy questions that have nothing to do with the thing you're there training on because you've sort of desensitized them to this intimate nature. It can also create an ongoing expectation of what is acceptable to ask other survivors. Right. So what happens is if people attend enough trainings where all survivors do is talk about their trauma all the time, they may encounter someone who they hear is a survivor and then be like, oh, let me ask you a very personal and intimate detail about one of the worst things you've ever been through without realizing that's that's really inappropriate. Right. People people don't typically like talking about these things. We want to remember that trauma responses among your audience can lead to less effective learning. But first, we need to think about what trauma is and how it relates to storytelling. So a trauma response comes out of skills we develop to manage situations where our bodies, our spirits, everything about us wanted and needed in that moment to fight, to flee, or to freeze, but for whatever reasons we weren't able to. And so instead of fight, flight, or freeze, we end up finding some way to act in contradiction to what our body is urging us to do. Our body is urging us to do this thing, and somehow we come up with a coping strategy to survive without being able to escape a hard situation. And so some of those coping strategies may include things like dissociating or mentally checking out. So dissociation is when your body's there, but your mind is somewhere else. You are completely not present in your body in that moment. And that can impact your memory. A lot of times we lose memories of things that, that we heard or that happened to us while we were um, dissociated. Uh, it can also lead to an impulse to act immediately to relieve ourselves of the discomfort we're feeling, right? We want to get out of this situation fast. I just want this, this discomfort I'm feeling from being hearing this trauma thing and having this, this activation in my body. I just want it to end, right? And so a lot of times the things we do when we act impulsively to make that discomfort end are not always very well thought out or strategic. And uh, very often in our movement work, they're not evidence-based. And so think about the impact that those two trauma responses might have on people you are training. If they get overwhelmed by all the salacious details, they may dissociate mm. to, to cope with that, which means that they are not going to remember the things that you're talking to them about. Uh, the other thing is if they have that impulse to act immediately, I'm uncomfortable hearing that this happens and I want to do something very quick to feel like I've helped. 
uh, without really engaging in the tough conversations about what would actually help this situation. That's how we end up with a lot of the rescue mentality that we have in the anti-trafficking movement. I don't want to inspire people to rescue. I want to inspire people to engage in meaningful change and to treat survivors as full humans and to respect survivors' autonomy. We need to remember there's also vicarious trauma, which is sometimes called um, secondary trauma. And that is when someone in their very own body, they experience those physical trauma responses, those chemical shifts and those urges and those sensations as a result of witnessing, hearing about, or regularly being exposed to other people's traumatic experiences right? So you're not the one that the trauma that's being described or that you're exposed to is happening to. It's happening to someone else, but it's kicking up your own body's trauma responses. It's not logical. It's physiological. And when your training participants experience vicarious trauma during your presentation, they may dissociate and not hear or remember the most important parts of what you were saying. Or they may only notice and remember the most sensationalized parts and shift into rescue mode, which really runs counter to the ideas of survivor-centered care. They may also find that this impacts them well beyond the training. Uh, I've had vicarious trauma experiences where it took me days to get to where I felt like I could let go of what my body was was, um, doing in response. And that means that we end up leaving people upset, sad, overwhelmed, and having a hard time doing the other activities. Which means we can, we can actually give some thought to what does it mean to engage in trauma-informed storytelling, right? We can remember prior trauma is not required to experience vicarious trauma, right? If, if you, even if someone has no trauma, they can still get vicarious trauma from hearing about or being exposed to trauma. But if someone has prior trauma, that can really amplify that vicarious trauma. And when we're in survivor-only spaces, we know we're dealing with people who have prior trauma. And I want to be thoughtful about whether or not um, I'm in a supportive therapeutic processing space where we have the time and roominess to discuss some of these things and the supports in place to make sure everyone's well cared for? Or am I in a a learning or professional collaboration space, even with other survivors, if I'm in a learning or professional collaboration space where we don't have the infrastructure set up to provide clinical, therapeutic, or mentoring support for people going through vicarious trauma based on what we're talking about, I'm going to limit the trauma details, right? And also just a reminder, even outside of spaces that are designed just for trafficking survivors, there's probably survivors of other kinds of trauma in the room with us. In any space we're in, if we want to be trauma-informed, we have to remember there are probably always trauma survivors in the room carrying the weights of their own experiences and traumas while hearing and taking in potentially traumatic information that we're presenting. And ultimately, it's not fair to put someone else unexpectedly into the space of being your emotional support person without them knowing that's what they were coming there to do and without their consent. It's asking them to do very intense labor for you when they thought they were coming to learn from you. I've been in spaces where someone was there to give us a, um, a training about somatic experiences of trauma healing and ended up spending so much time very powerfully and poetically sharing their trauma story that I could feel my body shifting into the kinds of um, structures and, and um demeanor and body language that I use when I was doing crisis response on a hotline. I could feel myself engaging my professional listening ears instead of my learning listening ears. And let's just be honest, telling your story over and over in all its glory with all the details, it can create trauma responses in you. If you are constantly retelling your darkest trauma details, then you are almost always using coping strategies, whether you are consciously aware of that or not. 
And a lot of times we do that through constant dissociation and numbing, which is a really, really, really beneficial and helpful survival strategy while you are in traumatic situations that you cannot leave. We do what we have to do to get by, but it's not conducive to your long-term trauma healing. And feeling consistently triggered by trauma, by talking about your story all the time, can lead to or increase our own emotional dysregulation, which then makes it harder for us to show up in our movement work, in our relationships, in our professional relationships, in our personal relationships. The other thing that might happen is you might get hooked on the feeling of widespread validation as a substitute for your internal healing and meaningful validation. If you know that whenever you share your story in a way that completely traumatizes everybody hearing it, that the only thing they can think of to tell you afterwards is how amazing you are, um, you're really not in a space where you're getting that internal healing that you need, where you can recognize, uh, start recognizing your own sense of value and worth and being amazing and getting validation for things that are really powerful. Um, you know, instead of sort of putting this uh, widespread validation over some of your feelings of insecurity as a Band-Aid over and over, right? The other thing that can happen is when you share your story and everybody's like, you're such a success. We've heard many survivors say that then creates a situation where you feel like you always have to be a success story. And that's just not realistic because healing's not linear. There's not like a, I start out traumatized and I land to where I've graduated from my trauma and now I am a success story all the time. All of us who are survivors of trauma wake up some mornings where we do not feel like success stories. A lot of times people who've experienced prior complex trauma are more likely for whatever reasons to have situations in the future that are hard. A lot of times because of the same risk factors that, that we've had, right? The same lack of societal and community support that we had that led to our initial uh, experiences of trauma. A lot of times we're still impacted by those, by those forms of oppression, those lack of support, those economic uncertainties. And then we look at our lives where they are now and we're like, oh, I'm a fraud. I'm really not a success story. When the reality is nobody's a success story all the time, right? So it creates this false expectation around how healed we're supposed to look in any given moment, which can then make those moments when we're not feeling quite so successful, especially hard to know what to do with and to navigate. And this means that in situations where our own trauma is being constantly kicked up by our storytelling repeatedly in graphic detail, it can impede, slow, or make, more, make it harder for us to heal from our trauma. We may also become desensitized to the magnitude and impacts of our own trauma, which may lead to us thinking of it as not a big deal. And then we spew these details and we re-traumatize someone else for whom it still is a big deal. Um, we're also more likely when we're constantly activated in our nervous system to react to other people from a place of being triggered rather than from a grounded state, from our wise mind, right? And in our work, our movement work, this can lead to really high levels of conflict and burnout, turnover, organizational trauma. And these things, just to be clear, these are not unique to survivors of trafficking. They can happen to any primary or secondary survivor of any trauma, right? But we have really normalized this storytelling in uh, public storytelling, in graphic detail, in anti-trafficking survivor spaces, um, which sort of puts us at the forefront. But the answer isn't that we pretend to not be survivors in these spaces, right? So we still want to be able to bring our whole self into our trainings and our educational um, endeavors that we're doing to, to uh, build awareness, to educate others. Um, and we need to remember no storytelling or all storytelling, those are not our only two options, right? There's a, there's a middle ground that has more complexity and nuance. We're also not always going to get it right. We're going to make the best choices we can in any given moment and continue learning and growing and give, give ourselves grace around the moments where maybe we shared too much or didn't share something we could have shared. We're all navigating this. We're all human, right? 
there are some things we can consider as we navigate that complex middle ground. So when you go to share a lived experience, consider who am I sharing this for and for what purpose? Is this the right space or audience for me to share this part of my story? Should I offer a content warning? And finally, do I even want to share details or am I just doing this because I feel like I'm supposed to as a survivor leader? So when we think about who is this for, we're kind of asking, are you doing this for you to get emotional validation? If so, this may not be appropriate for the training or educational setting. It may be appropriate for um, a support group or clinical setting. It might also be appropriate if you're a, a writer or um, actually just doing flat out storytelling to sort of share um, those things. But it, it might not be the best thing for an educational setting where because you're coming into it with an expectation that they're supposed to validate you. Um, think about what's the container, what's the appropriate container for your personal growth or healing. So if I know that I need and want validation, what do I need for the validation? What, what kind of settings, what sort of guidelines, what sort of group agreements do I need to feel like there's a container where I can share my story in a way that I can grow? How do we create that container with the people we're in community with and how do we maintain it? Again, in a one-off training, you may not have the time to create the kind of container you would need to have a safer, braver space for sharing stories in detail. And you also want to remember, sometimes when we come into it with an expectation that others will receive our story a, diff a certain way, you want to think through, how am I going to take care of myself and navigate a situation um, if someone questions the truth of my experiences while I'm speaking, what if they're like, that doesn't sound real, and I know I experienced it? What about if they ask an uncomfortable or intrusive question? For example, um, there's been instances where um, a survivor of sex trafficking who was training law enforcement during the Q&A, one of the attendees asked, are you still able to enjoy sex, right? That, that question has no place in a training. How are you going to handle it if someone asks a question that has a victim blaming tone or they suggest you contributed to your own trauma or if they minimize the impact of your experiences? Oh, I thought trafficking was worse. That really doesn't sound that bad. Or what if you experience a microaggression while or after sharing your story? Um, these all really suggest how important it is to have a safe container and conditions and expectations, right? You may also want to think through what happens if I get dissociated while I'm telling my story and all of a sudden I start telling more than I meant to tell, right? And, and it's kind of getting out there and going off the rails and I feel like I'm unable to bring myself back in. Who is my accountability partner who's here? who can give me that signal that lets me know that I can pause for a deep breath and regroup. You'll also want to think through what is the purpose of sharing this part of my story. So, for example, are there ways I can word this that are truthful, that meet my purpose, while being conscious um, to minimize traumatic impact to the audience or myself? So if my purpose is to help people know that threats to loved ones are part of coercion that may be used, then I can accomplish that purpose by saying, my traffickers threatened to harm my loved ones without needing to say, my trafficker told me that if I tried to leave, they were gonna do this and this and these other things and all these horrible things to my little sister, right? And then you're going into graphic detail about all the things they said they were gonna say or that they were gonna to do to your sister, right? Do you see how that gets the point and purpose without adding um, likelihood of increased traumatic impact? Think through, am I sharing the details to illustrate a point or demonstrate a skill in action? Um, if there's details, do these details really contribute to better understanding of your training goals? And then think through how much detail is needed to illustrate the point. Again, you can say, my trafficker kept me on substances throughout the majority of my trafficking time to maintain control. Instead of spending 10 minutes describing every single drug that was leveraged, every single drug they used, how they got you to take them, all the things they asked you to do while they were on drugs, 
during your years of trafficking, right? So remember when you're there to train, you have learning goals that are there for your training. And we want to keep the details relevant to our learning goals without overdoing the likelihood of traumatizing others. Because then we lose them and they don't hear the content. You're going to want to think, are there ways I can, um, you're going to want to think, um, what am I doing to help avoid the focus on my singular survivor experience? So is my purpose to get them to um, treat survivors just like me with the things that I needed? Or am I giving this piece of my story to sort of share about broad needs and then advocate for people whose experiences may have been different from my own? So, for example, if you say, if you say you were abducted from a playground, which we know that's not how most trafficking experiences happen, that's not how most recruitment happens, but say that you were then instead of just saying, my trafficker abducted me from a playground and here's everything that happened and why that matters, you can always remember that since that's an exception to what is most common, you could say, my trafficker abducted me from a playground, so my story is unique. Typically, traffickers know or spend time building trust with the person that they intend to exploit, right? So remember when you're sharing your details, those are just your details. There's a whole lot of different ways trafficking can look and happen. And we want to remember when we're in a role where we are teaching or educating or training, we need to help make sure we're having broad advocacy in what, the way we talk about it. You're going to want to ask yourself, is this the right space or audience for this part of my story? So sharing elements of your abuse um, might be uh, more relevant in some settings. In other settings, sharing elements of your experiences with the systems you are training may be more helpful. So, for example, if you're presenting to an audience of mental health providers or clinicians, you, they may find your experiences navigating mental health systems more helpful to them in improving their response than just hearing a whole lot more details about your trafficking experience. So, again, you have a limited amount of time to give a training you're gonna to wanna to make sure you get in the parts that are relevant. And that may mean leaving out some of the parts that are less oriented to the training goals. So you're gonna also wanna just remember some conversations are best left as in-group conversations instead of external uh, communications. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but if you have a certain identity or community you belong to, we all know that some hard conversations that are really, really challenging to have that are easier to have in non-public settings, right? So just be conscious of that. You're gonna to wanna to also um, think about the space. How are they holding the space? Did they create group agreements? Are you going into a present at a conference where at the beginning of the conference, they outlined group agreements for the whole conference attendees? And can you familiarize yourself with those? Do those feel comfortable? Do they moderate questions? Um, I know in some of the spaces where I've agreed to speak, I have them moderate questions where instead of someone just raising their hand and saying, do you still like sex? People turn in their cards on note on index cards. They turn in their questions written on index cards and the moderator chooses the questions that feel the most relevant to the training goals. So if you're speaking on a panel, you can ask about whether or not they provide moderation. Same thing if you're speaking online. A lot of times they have the Q&A to where it goes only to the panelists and presenters, and then they ask the ones that they feel are relevant. Was there any preparation required for the attendees? Meaning, if you have um, an audience uh, with a certain professional skill set, then those skill sets may be part of their preparation. But if you have an audience who doesn't have a certain professional certification, it may be that people are given like homework. You must complete the following thing before showing up in here. And that's um, not meant to be uh, gatekeeping, but that's meant to be ensuring that people are less likely to cause harm in your spaces. Um, does the person introducing you when you start at your, um, when you're first introduced at the beginning of the training or you maybe in your first couple of slides, do we provide expectations for appropriate behavior? Because sometimes just having that reminder can be very helpful and be part of creating the container. You're going to want to think about, do I need a content warning? All content warning means is that it's giving someone a heads up 
something that could potentially activate trauma is about to be referenced. Sometimes people call that a trigger warning or a content note. You may see that online, um, abbreviated as CW or TW or CN. And remember, trigger warning doesn't mean you may be offended. Trigger warning means something that is coming up is likely to, um, in, in many populations, it's very likely to trigger an activated embodied response. Because remember, trauma is embodied. A trigger warning doesn't mean being offended. It's when hearing or reading something about, uh, it activates the body's physiological responses to trauma. Someone hears about, reads about, or sees something traumatic, and suddenly their own body is producing these fight or flight um, impulses. It's not rational. It's not in the brain. You don't decide to have a trauma response. It's an unconscious response that happens in the body. And remember, unexpected trauma stories can be harder on emotional regulation than those we know are coming. If I'm having a conversation with someone and they say, I'm about to share some really hard stuff about, about sexual trauma I experienced, then I can shift the way I'm thinking so that I'm like, okay, so here comes a little bit of a story that feels that, that may feel traumatic. Whereas if it's just out of the blue, we're talking about, um, you know, interviewing skills, uh, like motivational interviewing skills, and all of a sudden someone sharing details of traumatic experiences from their childhood, that's a little more like emotional whiplash, which can be more likely to kick up a trauma response. Content warnings are a way to give someone a heads up so that they can either prepare internally to hear something hard or receive something hard, or so that they can choose their level of participation. Um, if there's a really heavy thing coming in a video training, sometimes I turn my camera off to get through it so that if, I can, if I'm visibly having a response, the person sharing it doesn't have to see that. Um, sometimes if I'm having a really horrible day, like maybe I'm going to this training after just having had something horrible happen in my family the day before, and I might be feeling a little bit raw and I may know that I'm coming to this training because I want to learn practical skills, but I may hear the part that there's a really detailed story coming up and I may, I may kind of step out for a moment. Um, I may check out mentally for a minute. It gives me a chance to prepare and whenever you give content warnings, you want to remember they need to be specific. Um, there, I sometimes, when I'm offering them in things I write, will say content warning for a mention of sexual abuse. That might be something where I'm mentioning that it happened or that it occurs, but not offering any details. And you might also want to word it differently and say, I'm offering a content warning for a description of sexual abuse, for example. So mention of versus description of. Because again, if I have that rough thing happen in my life or my family in the last couple of days, I might be better able to handle a mention of it. But if you say there's a description of it, I might know that I need to have some better supports for myself in place. And then remember, there's a difference on the specific on being specific between just saying trigger warning, what does that mean, right? Like what are, what are we warning me about? Um, so instead you might say trigger warning for racist violence, sexual abuse and police violence. And that gives people a heads up of the specific kinds of triggers that, that might be touched on. You wanna remember that just because you give a content warning doesn't mean that you now have a free pass to traumatize someone else as much as you want, right? We still wanna engage in a trauma-informed approach to storytelling. We gave the content warning, we let, it know, let them know that it's coming, and now we're still trying to be thoughtful because we care for each other, right? We're part of creating a community of care too. Um, remember everything that we've discussed earlier about how trauma impacts learning. So if someone has a trauma response and they dissociate and don't hear you, um, you know, even with a content warning, if you engage in excessive details that do not focus on the learning goals um, of the training presentation, you may still lose some people and their learning may still be less effective. So remember, we're always trying to find the balance between sharing enough detail to illustrate the points and not sharing so much that we lose them. And again, be gentle with yourself. We're not always gonna get this right, right? We live and learn, we hone our skills as we continue engaging in our work of training.
the last thing you'll really want to consider when sharing lived experiences is, do I even want to share details of my story at all? Because a lot of survivors don't. And just because someone hired you to come give a training, knowing that you have lived experience, doesn't mean that you owe them your details or your story, right? So self-disclosure of trauma and trauma stories should never be mandated or required in any training or educational setting. It should not be coercive or exploitative. If someone is having you share your details and they're telling you how you have to share it and what details you have to include in order to get paid, that's weird, right? And it should also be on your terms. You decide if and when you wanna share stories. You have choice about if and when you wanna share details. You can educate and train others without sharing the details of your lived experience if you don't want to. You can still be an amazing trainer and you can still bring your whole self into your work without feeling like you're somehow expected to be a professional survivor, that that's your job is to be a survivor full time for pay all the time, right? You can bring your whole self in without having, um, having to be tokenized, right? So a few final reminders, just remember some language you can use. Uh, these are phrases that when you're having to like navigate your own personal storytelling can be very helpful. So you may say something like some survivors experience and then share a detail without disclosing whether or not it was you. You could say some survivors may have experienced the following, right? Or you can say there have been cases where such and such happened. And you see how in each of these, you're not positioning yourself as the, the focus of people's um, biases and assumptions and expectations you're educating. And also remember, composite stories are your friend. We don't want to share someone else's trauma details on a regular basis. But if we've heard things enough times or seen them enough times, we can make up a composite story. And what that means is Instead of taking one person's story, you maybe imagine a fictional person or a composite person where you put together some different elements from different things you know have actually happened, but you mix it up, you take out the identifying information. It's not one person's story. It's sort of like a, a mashup of 15 different stories that you've read or heard about over the years so that you're not violating anyone's confidentiality or privacy. You're sort of creating a new character based on how you know trafficking really happens. Use those composite stories. You can mash up your experiences with other people you know, and then nobody feels like they're suddenly like entitled to intimate knowledge about you because you shared something. You're sharing a composite, right? They're only entitled to the information they need to learn the skills you're there to teach them. So thank you so very much for um, being here for this training, for watching this presentation. And if you'd like to learn more about the National Survivor Network, our values, or our educational opportunities, you can learn more at nationalsurvivornetwork.org.